Lucy Sand is a Belgian-born nonfiction writer, art critic, and cultural commentator of astonishingly wide interests, including the Beastie Boys, early photography, and the history of New York City reservoirs, including this really cool brand new book, 19 Reservoirs on Their Creation and the Promise of Water for New York City. She joins us to discuss her creative inspiration, craft, and career as part of tonight's Creative Life series. Lucy Sant is an amazing author, best known for Low Life, about crime and entertainment in old New York, 1840 to 1919, and her collected essays, Kill All Your Darlings, Pieces, 1990 to 2005. A second collection, Maybe the People Would Be the Times, is right here. All these books are out in the lobby, by the way. Came out in 2020. She wrote about her recent gender transition in the February 2022 issue of Vanity Fair. Just retired from teaching at Bard College. History of photography as well as writing. And now, with retirement, has time to be with us. Will you still please welcome Lucy Sant. Thank you. How are you? I'm good. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it seems as though you've, uh, I'm interested in what the, what brought retirement to you, what dis, of how that sort of comes in your life and, and you say, okay, and does that bring in a different stage? To life? Not particularly. I, I, you know, I was always very part-time. I taught one class, one day a week uh, for well, at Bard for 23 years, um, and I was actually going to wait until I turned 70. But I happened to mention to my department head, I was thinking of retiring, and he said, "Do it now. We've got the people in place, and there's not going to be a budget, you know. So whatever. Sure. Okay, I'll do it. Um, <laughs> anyway, it takes one." you know, kind of a piece of anxiety off my shelf and um, and I feel a little bit more relaxed, but it's not that big a difference all, overall. When you think of your career, and I mean, the the line that I read at the beginning was, was how varied it is. And how, how do you think of it? How do you describe it? Um, I have a bunch of interests, and um, and the thing that amazes me is I can always, I can connect all my interests back to interests I had when I was 14, um, and you know I I mean I guess I'm kind of I I, I resist being a specialist. I've never wanted to be uh, an expert in anything, and I write about what interests me. I've been lucky enough to be able to do that. Um, and um, I have certain subjects that I return to, cities, for example, the past, the origins of things, stuff like that, but rotates. Photography, of course, a big part of that. Photography, yeah. What was the initial lure to photography? Well, that's a funny thing, because that's something I backed into kind of accidentally. Um, I wrote my first book, Low Life, about New York, and then searching for pictures to illustrate the book, and I had no idea what I was doing. I'd never searched for pictures before. And I happened upon the um, police evidence photos at the municipal archives, and they were remarkable pictures, uh, taken between 1914 and 1918, of murders, mostly, uh, taken by cops um, with, um, large format plate cameras and um, and I was just hypnotized by these pictures and I knew I had to do a book. So right after, a year after Low Life, I did this book called Evidence, which is with these pictures. And right away I started getting people asking me to write about photography, in part because at the time there were not that many people writing about photography. And you know, photography is such a part of everything um, that we forget that photography was not taken very seriously, not that long ago, the um, the Metropolitan Museum of Art did not have a Department of Photography until 1984. Huh. Uh, the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston still doesn't have one. Its photographs are filed under prints. 
Um, so, you know, for a while, I was almost the only game in town. No longer the case, mind you. What do you think it, it, that you brought to it of writing about photography that it was important to to show and explore about the art form? Well, I mean, the thing, I mean, I'm interested in photography in very broad sense. I mean, I did teach the history of photography for all those years, um, but my main interest is in, um, well, photography up to the first half of the 20th century. And I'm interested in photographs both aesthetically and uh, socio-historical objects evidence and um, I'm most interested in photographs that do both um, mm -hmm. so I'm I'm looking for evidence of the way people lived uh, but I also want the aesthetics of it including the beautiful accidents you know and um, I like the fact that photography can entirely be controlled. I mean, the one aspect of photography I don't let much, I'm not that much interested in is studio photography, which is very controlled. I like street photography where you can only control so much. You're at the mercy of all kinds of elements. And that's what interests me. It's an, a moment in time. So let's take what you just said mm -hmm. And then let me add the words, so what does it take to be a good photographer to be able to achieve that? Ooh, um, golly. Well, the fact is, you know, one thing I'm, so I'm very interested in is anonymous photography. Um, I mean, I think in a way anybody can be a good photographer. Uh, to be a consistently good photographer is to have a particular style a particular kind of alertness, um, but um, you know, I'm 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 interested in f photography by photographers, but I'm also interested in as as a kind of authorless art, in a way. So, how do you feel about the way photography is presented and shown now, primarily with on on the internet mm -hmm. through Instagram and Snapchat, dot, dot, dot. Right, well, you know, um, Instagram is, I mean, I follow a lot of photographers. I also follow photo dealers and photo collectors and, um, and I'm fascinated by all of it. Um, you know, the thing is, I mean, I really do like photographs. Uh, I like them as objects, as objects that have, live through time. So I really like photographs that are kind of messed up. I, the, I like the bent corners. I like the, uh, the, you know, the coffee stains. I mean, I really do actually like that. Um, evidence of where a ph photograph has been. And one thing I wrote a book about is uh, the real photo postcard, which was this fad that swept the world, really, but especially the United States, in the first decade or two of the 20th century. And there, often, they've been mailed. So you have the address, you have the, um, the recipient, you have the message, and then you have the cancellation, you have the, it's been handled by different hands. I, I love the ensemble of it. It's a time capsule. And and that could be, and those were mostly photos, but were not exclusively. Well, the, the ones I'm interested in are the ones that are, are photos. photos. Of, yeah. of, of real places. That were, well, they're called real photo because they were made in the dark room rather than the right. litho press. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and, and mostly of what? Small towns. Um, you know, there's some big city stuff too, but mostly it's small towns. They're made by the town photographer who might also be the druggist or something. Um, and they show the parade, they show the fire, they show the new baby sometimes, they show the high school graduating class, all the church picnic, you know, all this stuff. And um, some of them are generic, some of them are brilliant, some of them, are brilliant in ways that must be the work of an artist. Sometimes they're brilliant in ways that you cannot tell how it happened. How did you come to to find that essayist voice of of sharing your thoughts on things that that you were comfortable with? 
Well, um, probably because I, um, I got a job um, in 1980 when I was 26. I was hired in the mailroom at the New York Review of Books. Yeah. And a year later, I was asked by Barbara Epstein, who's one of the two editors, to become her assistant. And after working for her for about six months, I thought, gee, I can think I might be able to do this myself. So I submitted a piece on spec. But I was very influenced by the writers of that time. And of course, it was a great lineup in those days. You know, Elizabeth Hardwick, Joan Didion, many, many great writers. And I consciously modeled my style at first on them. And But I guess, you know, a lot of it remained. And, you know, I became me at some point. In becoming you of, of that voice, what do you think resonated with readers, with people? And also, and, and New Yorkers, really. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> I've got to say, I really don't know. Do you ever wonder about it, or is it not of interest? Well, yeah. I mean, I guess I wondered about it, but then one is afraid to probe too deep in case one breaks the spell, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, there is that, uh, but there's also there's an, an anonymity to it, right? That it's when when you're writing, it's a, it's a solitary process. Yeah. And then you send it out into the world, and you don't, you know, you know probably know more now than we used to know of what right, people are saying right. about the work. Sure. Um, I mean, I know. I think I know kind of what my strengths are. You know, I. I'm good at keeping things moving, or you know, I, I tell jokes. Um, you know, I have a pretty good memory. Uh, you know, but um, and um, and also, I mean, I, I I began life as a poet, so I think I've got a certain rhythmic sense. Does does that is that always present in the writing? That that rhythmic sense? Oh, totally. Yeah, absolutely. Because it has to play to my ear. You know. Almost like a human metronome, really. Well, I'm not c quite counting syllables, although, you know, when I write, I can't have music on or anything like that because it throws me off. So there must be some kind of counting process that's only semi-conscious. Are you a, do you consider yourself a fast writer? No. I mean, well, okay. I'm a very, <laughs> very slow writer at the beginning. And as I go on, in a, whatever it is, a, a piece, a book, I gradually get faster and faster until I'm, when I'm going toward the end, then I'm really racing. Um, so my page count increases as I go through whatever. And when you're doing, and then of course some of it's on deadline, so you, I mean, you, you, you have to do it. I'm sorry? You, uh, some oh, of it's deadline. on deadline. Right? Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. And do you, I mean, does that enter into it or no? Uh, you know, I try to respect deadlines. Um, <laughs> I don't always make it. Theirs or yours, or both? Well, theirs, yeah. Because uh, me, um, well, I like to, you know, I do need to get paid, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. The, the Vanity Fair piece that you wrote earlier this year, how, how long did that take to write? Well, that one took like um, three or four days. That was very fast. Really? Well, yeah, because it was all this stuff that was bottled up inside, so it was, I knew what I was going to say. But I mean, that, that's one thing. I mean, generally speaking, when I write something, I don't really know what I'm going to say, because I'm usually working something out on the page. But in that case, I mean, it was already there. Um, so I just had to put it down black and white. And I'm writing the memoir, which is associated with this, uh, the inevitable trans memoir. And it's also, I've never written so fast in my life. I'm writing over a thousand words a day, so. Is that comforting? Comforting? I guess you could say so. It's I like, mean, and I asked the question specifically because of the idea of something being bottled up. I mean, right. it's being contained. So if you allow it to go, that that would seem that it would have a certain comfort to it. Well, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I especially, you know, I'm, I find myself writing about, you know, my adolescence, which I've never written a word about ever. So it's great to be getting the stuff out. What should we know about your adolescence? Yeah, read the book. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, is that is that painful at all? 
No, not at all. Not painful. I mean, one thing is um, I very I wrote very little about myself in the past. In fact, I spent, I mean, my first, the 10 years that elapsed between when I started as a professional writer and for magazines and when I published my first book, I may not have used the word I a single time in published writing. Um, and so I gradually got yeah, a little bit closer. And I wrote a memoir in the 90s called The Factory of Facts, which is about, well, I'm an immigrant, so it's about, you know, where I come from, my family, immigration, etc. But I was trying to write about it from the historical long view, so I was leaving most me and my emotions mostly out of it. So it's like a memoir without a subject, kind of. But now, um, well, coming out, um, my, the, the term of art, my, when my egg cracked in February 2021, um, Suddenly, I was, well, I was a different person for in a di number of ways, but one of them was that I was no longer carrying, I was no longer hobbled by a secret. I carried the secret around for the better part of 60 years, and having no secret anymore made me feel extremely light. So it's not painful, you know, it's all gravy, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just, so not phased by so much stuff now that I'm no longer carrying around this 500 pound burden. D did you, at, at what point did you know that the egg was starting to crack and this is something that you were going to? It happened very fast. It happened extremely fast and I had no idea because I really thought I was going to take the secret to my grave. I mean, I, I intended to. And then all of a sudden, um, well, what happened is I, I, I put a picture of myself through FaceApp and switched genders, and then for some reason was moved to then take almost every picture of myself, and there aren't a lot, mind you, because I was very camera shy, um, past all these pictures, like 50, 60, 70 pictures through FaceApp, and then I could see my whole life, or the alternate life I might have had, and that just, unlocked this door in me and within two weeks I'd come out to my shrink, my partner, my son and you know 30 of my closest friends and that was it. It was you know it was one way street, no turning back. The, the WhatsApp, this fascinates me, so you would take photos th throughout your life yeah. and put them through. That's right. So you would see yourself at 10, 20, 30. Right. And d does, does that seem to represent, if, if this is the correct term, the truer you? Yeah, it does. I mean, it was like, it was eerie because what I was seeing was the life I might have had or the life I was surreptitiously leading in my head, you know, um, I was faced with, it became, you know, this fictional representation manufactured by an app somehow told the truth and that was overwhelming. So did it leave you at all thinking that the prior 60 years were fictional? Well, they weren't entirely fictional, but there was, you know, I mean, they weren't fictional, no, but what they were was hobbled. Hobbled. Were, you know, they had, my previous 60 years had, you know, one arm tied behind its back or something, you know, I mean, um, I was not ever being my whole self, and I was not, you know, I was unable to, con I, even, you know, my closest friendships involved me keeping something back. So there was an element of untruth in my daily life for all that time. And I thought I had to keep it concealed for a lot of reasons. And so, um, you know, so I was given to know the truth. The, the moment of, of, I was asking about your, about your writing, earlier and, and the, the speed of it, it is, is the writing different now? 
That's a good question. You know, my, my, my erstwhile partner, one of the very first things she said to me was, are you going to start writing fiction now? And actually, the answer is probably no, because my problem with fiction is I have very little sense of story, which is kind of essential there. But, um, <laughs> but um, you know, I'm able to write about, I guess I'm able to write about people and relationships in a way that, I mean, write, again, you know, this is writing about myself. Um, I'm able to write about interpersonal relationships in a way that I couldn't have done before. Is it um, when you started, uh, there was a year that went from the time of the egg cracked, as you say, to writing that piece in, in Vanity Fair, which I assume you always eventually knew you were going to write for the world. Mm -hmm. And so what went into that, that planning and say, okay, this is, this is how I'm going to tell that story? Well, you know, I'm actually, the way it happened was I came out on Instagram in September, which was my big public availing after coming out to successive rings of friends, colleagues, etc. And then, you know, this was the public coming out. And then... Uh, an editor at Vanity Fair I'd worked with before said, why don't you write a piece for us? And then I, like I say, I wrote it in three or four days. And I didn't plan it. Uh, it just, I wrote it the way it came out. And, uh, you know, I mean, uh, I guess my inner editor kicked in and shaped it, but um, really I didn't, there's not a lot of planning went into that. What kind of response did you get? from people? Oh, tremendous response, you know. I mean, I, keep, I still hear about, you know, I get emails and stuff and people have said, uh, you help me or you help my child or you help my neighbor, you know. It's, uh, that was really remarkable because nobody had ever accused me of helping them with my writing before. <laughs> did, did you, uh, w would someone have have helped you earlier, do you think? Maybe. Oh, would someone have helped me? Probably not. I'm too headstrong. I, you know, I, uh, I probably would have resisted very strongly. And, and did you, so that's, it's still fascinating to me of what the moment was that said, okay, now's the... Now's I know, the I'm fascinated by that too. I tried many times, uh, did I have any premonitions? And, you know, I can only come up with vague, woolly answers, you know, well, there was this, and then there was that, but they both seem tangentially related at best. I really don't know how it happened, and why and then, why not, you know, I don't know. Um, I, my, my partner suggested that, you know, we just had a really, I hate to say it, and forgive me, but we had a really lo nice lockdown year. We were very cozy, you know. We, uh, so we had a house and, you know, uh, we live in Kingston and it was, you know, could exercise by walking around and didn't feel deprived and neither of us got sick. Uh, so maybe it was just the comfort and snugness of that year that made me feel comfortable enough to do it. I, that may be. I don't oh, that's know. fascinating. Yeah. yeah. Is there also maybe an, maybe an element of just oh, God, I'm tired of being somebody else? Maybe. Yeah. I mean, certainly. You know. Of course, the historical moment has something to do with it because, um, I mean, I knew I was. My new, or in, you know, somehow, like, I mean, the, the terminology is all wrong for the time, but let's say I knew I was transgender when I was eight or nine, but it was wrong. You know, there, it was unheard of. I thought I was the only person who'd ever felt this way. And then gradually over the years, you know, and years and years and years of it seeming like a freakish thing, and I didn't want to be freakish, you know. And then, I mean, especially teaching undergraduates and seeing the change among the younger generation and um, people in their 20s um, who, you know, almost e even like my son, who I always say is straight as a highway in Texas, he fully understands gender change because he's been surrounded by it um, since he was 
12 or something, uh, you know? I mean, young people are at ease with the fluidity of genders and changing genders, and being in a milieu with young people certainly helped me a lot. You talk about the time, and I certainly understand what you're saying, but it was also very politicized. It was also... Politicized. Politicized, that's true, yeah. And, and I, I mean, that, that has to be hindering, not for you, but certainly for others. Right. No, I mean, it's very hard for a lot of people, and I realize I'm in a uniquely privileged situation here, yeah. Do, how do you feel about it... Um, being politicized, I mean, I, I know, um, I know that's an obvious question, but as far as how you you deal with that and and talk about the issue in a way that can also kind of open up the conversation mm -hmm. for more people to understand. Right. I mean, for example. Um, I mean, it's, you know, what they're doing in Texas, for example, absolutely outrageous. And, you know, this, like, um, this language of they're taking children and twisting them around and manipulating their whatever. And, you know, first of all, children, I mean, I would have been deeply offended to be referred to as a child when I was 14 or 15. And I think any 14, self-respecting 14, 15 year old is able to make up their own minds about stuff. Uh, furthermore, you know, I am a living refutation of the idea that it's a fad and will pass. You know, since I've been lugging this thing around for, you know, since the, uh, you know, the Johnson administration. <laughs> That's, I, I mean, even now, I think it's often refer, it, it's thought of as a fad, right? I mean, that yeah. that is a, a very concerning part of the conversation. That's right. Yeah. Um, you hear that especially when you're talking to... Um, educators, not educators themselves, but in, in schools and in school boards where mm -hmm. they're just, well, we have to deal with this and then we'll move on and then we won't have to deal with it anymore. Right, right, right. But no. <laughs> Sorry, they're wrong. Yeah. yeah. So how do we get over that? Well, it's going to be really hard uh, because, um, well, you know, of course, one of the uh, uh, you know, one of the aspects of the conservative point of view is, gee, the world is so complicated, we need to keep it really simple. A switch, B switch, you know, so there are two genders, bang, bang, and, you know, you, you went through that door, you stay in that door. Um, and uh, no, actually, there are at least 999 genders, really. I mean, I'm old, so I'm still binary, but, you know, younger people are not quite in that dualistic framework. Um, and um, it's, um, I mean, you know, it may be something that will gradually take hold so that everybody's used to it after a while. But there's such a current of reaction right now that it's going to be tough. I mean, the, um, you know, and look at what we had to get to to get gay rights. I mean, you know, I think we, you know, I mean, could it have happened without AIDS, for example? Or would it have taken much longer? Anyway, I mean, you know, there, there had to be a sort of, had to be a disaster for that to happen. Um, I hope there isn't an, an equivalent disaster here. But, um, but I think we will start to come to realize eventually that sex and gender are two different things. This is what people need to know. They are not the same. We've been used to thinking of them as the same, partly because so much about, you know, our thinking is based on, you know, agrarian societies from 5,000 years ago that don't necessarily apply now. It, it, we, we talk so much about the, the fear of the other and, and of, of things that we, that we don't understand and why that is, is often just cast aside by many because they don't understand it. Mm -hmm. do, do, you, do you feel that in your, um, that, that there's a, 
I guess want a better word, but let's say burden on you of, of sort of fully understanding it when you talk about it? Well, I try, you know. I mean, I'm not a biologist, you know. I, there, and plus, there's so much we don't know. I mean, there's various theories about what causes, you know, gender dysphoria, and the fact is nobody really knows. And in part, that's because it has been so little studied, and it's, why has it been so little studied? Because there's no funding for it. Um, so it's really, I mean, there's so many enigmas in this field. So I keep myself informed as best I can, um, but I'm also speaking out of my own experience and right. for myself, I'm not a politician. <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, are are you? How how did it manifest itself for you when it when you were eight, nine, ten, when you knew, and yet it, you 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 had this you had the secret and you were carrying it, but did you ever allow a glimpse of it just to yourself? Well, sure. Yeah. I mean, I thought about it all the time. I thought about it every day. Yeah. But you know there were many conflicts, and and that's sort of when you're say in a room and then out, right? I mean, there's a of like when you're alone, mm -hmm. and then the minute you that's a different. Well, there's that, but there's also like inner conflict too, right? Right, because you know I thought, a, I don't want to be a freak, and you know also, you know. I'm attracted to girls, and girls were going to be turned off by this. You know, um, would have been a lot easier if I'd been attracted to boys, but you know, it didn't happen that way. Um, so, um, you know, so for many years, I would like decide, okay, uh, this time I'm fully banishing that vice that I have. That's the way I would put it to myself. For a long time, I mean, even fairly recently, I was still thinking in those terms. And I would uh, applaud transgender people. I thought it was great, but I also thought, well, I'm not quite one of them. You know, it's the the, the way one can deceive oneself is just endless. I'm not one of them. Yeah, yeah, because you're well, because nothing's an even comparison, right? It's it's always going to be well. I'm different because right, this right. is how I feel about yeah. it. Yeah. So. <laughs> you write that piece, and then the next thing that comes out is a book about reservoirs. <laughs> so, yeah, right. Bait and switch. How do? <laughs> so how does that happen? <laughs> well, what happened is that that book was actually written the year before. Um, I was. Um, I wrote it as a magazine series. I had a friend who's an editor who went to work for. Um, San Francisco-based online magazine called Places Journal, which is about architecture, society, ecology, et cetera. And it always bugging me to write a piece for them. And I thought, well, these are not my topics. I don't really... And then I, I thought about the reservoirs. I've been living upstate... Uh, well, I've been living upstate full-time for 22 years, and then... I had five years before that in Delaware County, uh, so been around reservoirs a lot, and I thought maybe, and I, that I'd always had in the back of my mind that I wanted to write about the reservoirs because I was haunted by the story, and um, seemed a perfect time to write it, and then somebody offered to make it into a book, the wonderful people at um, The Experiment Incorporated who made this beautiful book out of it. Um, and that was kind of something I wasn't expecting. I certainly didn't expect to follow up my Vanity Fair piece with this book. But, <laughs> yeah. The memoir, I guess, would have been... Uh, we were talking about this backstage, but the, the book itself as a piece of art is just gorgeous. I mean, if you get a chance to to look at it, or God forbid, even buy it. Um, it it's a beautiful, beautiful yeah, object. I, I like to put pictures in books, and I've never seen, I've never had a book of mine use pictures as well as this one. The, the weight of the paper alone is just incredible. So the, is the main uh, project now the memoir? That's the project for now, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's I'm, I'm actively doing it and I'm past the halfway mark. Yeah. And the usual answer is, when's it coming out? And the usual answer is, about a year after I finish. <laughs> But it is, but you, as you said, it is happening quickly. Yeah, it's very, yep. And, uh, and that must be reassuring. Do, do, yeah. you, do you have to, um, how, how do you, uh, this will be my final question, then I want to hear from the, uh, the audience, but do, do you, uh, when you write something, when you're writing that story, it's, you're writing about yourself, uh, who do you have to check in with? Anyone? I mean, do you worry about who else? I mean, I have various imaginary readers in my head. Uh, this is something I learned from W.H. Auden, is you always have a committee of readers in your head. Um, so, you know, one of them should be some, a pedant, one of them should be somebody who's barely literate but has strong opinions, there should be, you know, a, a child, um, there should be a great aunt, you know, et cetera. So you have a whole battery of readers in, in your head that you read the text through successively. Um, some of them are fictional characters and some of them are real people, you anticipate what they're going to say. So you have all these, the system of checks and balances, always. The new book is 19 Reservoirs on their creation and the promise of water for New York City. I hope you will join me in thanking Lucy Sant. <laughs>